Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I would like first to thank uh, Catherine and Rory for inviting me here. It's really an honor to be speaking uh, in front of you guys. I'd like also to thank uh, uh, my team in Montpellier and beyond at SLB to be uh, online and everyone online are listening. So my name is Raphael, as uh, he said. I'm coming from Montpellier in the south of France. Um, and I, um, I lead the research and design studio of uh, a technology center um, inside the digital organization of SLB. SLB, for those who don't know um, uh, what this company is, it's about 100,000 people worldwide. We are working in the energy industry. We are actually um, a technology company and we are driving innovation in, in the energy industry. So the reason why I'm here today is because I wanted to share uh, the outcome of uh, two very long uh, stories, actually, a, a professional journey and a very personal journey. Um, something that took me 20 years to understand and to reveal a message and a, um, an insight that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, these two projects that I'm going to refer during the, um, that presentation are first a professional journey working on a product called Wellbore, which is a geoscience complex system in the energy industry and a personal one, writing, um, composing, directing, and producing a musical called Time City. So, what is the link between designing a complex system and writing a musical tale? Well, that's what you're going to find out. First, let me clarify what I mean by system. So, this is just my, my uh, way of seeing systems to simplify a little bit what they are. You have the websites, to me they are very simple in the sense that it's just you know, pure information that you consume, you navigate as a user inside it, but the, the interactions are fairly limited. Then you have the simple system, there can be mobile applications for instance, where you start having a, a bit more complex interactions, it's not uh, you can interact with somebody else for instance. Then you have the advanced systems, which um, are, for instance, PowerPoint or Word or Mural or Mural, or th these kind of, of systems that are fairly simple to apprehend. They don't require advanced skills, and they help you generate data and generate content. Then you have the um, complex systems, which are of a little different nature because you don't just generate data, you also consume complex data, and they fall into the realm of professional domain. So it can fall under the, you know, the military, um, the energy industry, the music industry, the medical industry. You know, the, I'm talking about this type of systems that are made for professionals that require advanced domain knowledge. And an example, and actually an example that I started uh, working with uh, back in 2015 when I uh, joined the Montpellier Technology Center is I worked on a product called Techlog that was... Um, built by the team for uh, years, and that is, still is serving the energy industry. And the purpose, so this, when I'm talking about complex system, I'm talking about this kind of data, you know, interpreting data. And beyond the complex system, then, um, there is the platforms, which are a collection of systems, whatever, you know, the complexity of them, that live uh, together and that constitute, for instance, the Adobe suite or the Office suite. And then the last level of system of complexity is to me what, I, what is called you know, the, 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 the ecosystem, where systems are working together and there is meaning that is associated to each one of them, where you want to serve something greater than just a collection of applications. Because, for instance, that I will be flowing from an application to another one, and it's going to serve a greater uh, journey. And when I showed you TechLog, so... TechLog is a complex system, and the journey that I'm going to reflect back um, on the professional side of things is the one from moving from TechLog to a product called Wellbore, which is a complex system, in, in the, not in an on-prem system, not a desktop application, if you want, but something in the web, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, algorithms, etc., and, of course, completely changing the interface and, and the user's experience of it, and making, live, making it live in coexistence with other complex systems and have data you know, flow in and flow out of the system and serving other people, other domains. Now, that being said, how did I start? Well, I started when I joined uh, you know, the, the center 
working as a user experience architect, working on guidelines. That was the, you know, the, the, the quickest approach I thought, um, uh, or the best approach to take, given you know, the, the knowledge or the absence of knowledge that I had around the domain. So I took you know, some user experience guiding principles, I crafted them, you know, went uh, further, tried to understand the domain as well, and build up these uh, elements, very conceptual elements. And there was a problem. The problem is that it was difficult to sell these highly conceptual elements, uh, principle, user experience-driven uh, principles, into uh, the systems and the domain owners, some people who were driving products and who had constraints and who, um, I have to say, you know, were also discovering the user experience journey and the design and research. So what I did afterwards is that I started digging much more to understand the vocabulary of these domain people and go away from the conceptual world and dig into something more pragmatic. And this meant diving into the persona, of course. In the persona, um, the, the, the step that I took afterwards was to dig into the job. So you've probably heard about uh, Clay um, uh, Christensen, you know, the, this uh, famous video about uh, the job. Uh, it's a video that I watched a, a couple of years ago, and it really changed the paradigm of how I was approaching the, the, this entire uh, big problematic. And then I started diving into the jobs of the people that I was you know, supposed to build the experience for, the geoscientists. And the geoscientist is a big word, a, a big name for a persona, but in reality, a geoscientist is many, many different people. It can be a petrophysicist, a geologist, it can be a drilling engineer, it can be a fluid model, a geomechanist. Some, so it's, it's all about subsurface, you know, the uh, geoscience um, and the subsurface interpretation. And how, you know, when we pull data off the subsurface of the Earth, what uh, sense can we make out of this? And then I started digging into the jobs of why these people were doing these jobs and what were the things that they wanted to achieve. You know, what were these little pieces of puzzles that they had to complete so that their job was done. And what I discovered, what I unveiled, let's say, is their needs, their hidden needs. And it's not the needs that they were saying, I need this, or the things that you know, the domain owners would tell me. It's more needs that were analyzed and digested in a design manner, let's say. The things that then could be able to be consumed by me as a designer, to start crafting the system. So, um, and the needs, I mean, of course, the needs, it's the jobs that are meant to be done. So that's the first insight about that step in the journey. It's that the essence of the persona lies in the clarity of the needs, in the clarity of the job that they have to do. Now, that being said, I want it to make a parallel with the, the writing uh, process of writing Time City, because something very, very similar happened. Um, and it's you know, reflecting back that I un understood that it was extremely similar. So first, to talk about uh, just a few words about Time City to understand what it's, what it's about um, and how it came. It came in a different manner than Wellbore. Wellbore, there was a business vision. You know, to reduce by 120 percent, uh, 20 times the time to, to achieve things, and then it took me a few years to start crafting the vision of the of the of the system. Time City, the vision was very quick. I was in a train, I was I was daydreaming, and I had, you know, I, I saw that scene in my head of statues awakening, you know, in a in front of a mansion. They would come down and start dancing an infernal ball, and then this image stayed, and then I used that and I started writing, and I actually took a picture of the very first version of the notes that I took to write the first version of the script back in 2005 or 6. And as you can see, you have the beginning of a plan, and you have elements of a universe, and then it, it helped me you know, start putting in place some concepts about the, the play, about the tale. And then there was a problem, a very similar problem than the one I faced with, um, with uh, Wellbore. 
Um, and the problem was that the story was dull. It was... It, the storyline seemed a bit forced, and it seemed a bit uh, fake in the sense, you know, things were happening, the, um, events after events, but meaning was, re was not really here. And it took me eight years of writing multiple versions of that script until I reached a point where I submitted the script to be reviewed or read by uh, all the people, including a stage director who told me, you know, I read it and the first scene, I, th I thought, yeah, that's what I want to produce. And then I kept on reading and then something was wrong and I couldn't really tell you why, but... Well, you know what, you should just, you should buy this book and read it. So he told me about this book, uh, which means dramaturgy, and then I started exactly like for World War, I started digging much more into the domain, into the domain of writing. And then I discovered about, you know, the narrative structure and what it means. And what I started first working on, after I had, you know, dived into this, is work on the characters. And the problem with my story initially was because of the fact that the characters were dull and I did not understand them clearly enough. So, you know, I started working on the archetype, digging to their psychology. And this is a picture of, you know, some um, um, files that I started working on afterwards to start crafting deeper the, the, my, my characters. So you can see there, you know, what's the, what's the desire, what's the archetype, what's the fascinating characteristic, what are the elements of the characters that is inherently making meaning and that the audience will be able to attach themselves to. And from there comes the parallel with Wellbore and the persona, which is the essence of stories light, lies in internal and external conflict for the character. And that's extremely important to understand because when you have that triptych where you build the character, you work on the objectives of the character and their limits, then you start working on drama. And that's when people start connecting with the story. And that's actually when meaning starts to happen. Magically speaking, it happens. And then, as a summary, and that's the, the very touching point between Walbor and the initial touching point between Walbor and Time City is that it's critical to work on the, on the archetypes. First, when I worked on, on Walbor, on the persona, it thinks that, you know, and many of you, I'm sure, have been doing because you were told to do so. And I've been doing that without really understanding why. But if you don't work on the archetype, if you don't nail the needs, the hidden needs, and you don't really understand that, I mean deeply understand that, there's no point in defining an experience. Because you will not be able to understand the meaning that you want to create. So work on the archetype, define their need, picture the initial situation, the present situation that they're in, as the persona or as the character at the beginning of the, of the play. And then identify the problem that they have to overcome, the reason to build the product, and then you have the first elements to build something meaningful. Now, once the archetype is nailed, let's say it's, you've worked on that, for Wellbore, what we started doing is design. And design starts by a storyboard or a user journey. This is an example of a user journey uh, for Wellbore, where you can see steps, tasks, and even screens that we're thinking about to build to make sense of that journey. journey. From the user journey, then we started working, and as an architect, I was also working on defining the information architecture that then could serve as the basis to build the navigation system of the application. But the information architecture is very simple, and it's an old one. You know, it evolved, it, it got simplified a bit, but still, it's very simple. You have a list of projects. You enter inside a project, you have a dashboard, and then from the dashboard, you explore the data, the information, and then you dive into the task that you want to do, into more complex elements, and then you complete the jobs that, there is, that, as a user, you want to do. But there was a problem again. And, the, and this problem, I'm going to talk about the exact same problem that I faced with writing Time City. 
And this problem was as we were working with the team to build the experience, working on the dashboard, on the list, etc., and trying to identify the elements of information that made sense, we were a bit stuck at some point. And we didn't know how, either how to prioritize or to choose what type of information to put. We could, of course, ask the users, hey, what do you need? What do you think of that? What would you like to have? But it, we kept being, and I could see that in a way we were stuck and we couldn't progress really up to the end. Now, the parallel with Time City is, and I have to explain to you why, uh, a little bit about the purpose of the story itself so you understand why it changes everything. The story of Time City is a very complex story uh, in its nature because it's a cyclical story that starts, and at the end of the story, at the end of the show, you go back to the beginning. A little bit like we know in some movies, you know. But that's one constraint, an artistic constraint that I wanted to put. But there's another one which is much more complex, which is it's the story of one couple, two couples, three couples, four couples. One are the hero, one are the antagonist, one they are the challengers, and one they are a secondary person. And they are all living the exact same story at different moments in time. And the, the tale that is presented to the audience is just one-fourth of the archetypal story, if you want. So by the end of the story, each character has taken their own, the, the next uh, seat of the other one. And you have to have the aha moment in the end so that it's the revelation. And these were constraints, huge constraints to write the entire story. And the reason why this is so important is because when I started trying to um, take into consideration this constraint and write the story, what I did is I defined the main steps of the story, you know, dividing act one, two, three, what would be the scenes, what would be happening in the scenes. And there was a problem exactly like I had with Wellborn. As I was writing an N version of the script, I was stuck into some scenes because despite the work that I had done on the, on the archetypes and on the characters, there were scenes where the meaning that I wanted to, to weave until the end was not really here. So I changed my perspective and I did something, and that's the reason why I wanted to make this talk first, is I started working backwards. And what that means is that for Wellbore, I worked with a colleague, Jean-Étienne, hi. <laughs> and we worked together on a, um, on, on a big white board and then a mural. And then we went further in, inside the information architecture, staying a little bit um, highly at a high level, not dig too much into the details, but at least try to understand exactly what the people who were using the system were supposed to do at the end of the information architecture. And from there, then I started designing backwards. I took the end of the information architecture and I started designing, you know, high, higher fidelity elements. And I'm going to tell, take just one quick example of what it means in terms of information. If we take the last step, you know, the, the further inside the information architecture and we dive into it and we design it, then we can have Something like that, where there is information, data, elements that the user needs to do to do the QC, the quality check of the data. And as an example, the thing uh, highlighted here, the bad hole points, it's a piece of information of data that, that the user needs to have so that they understand what they're working on. But it's actually something that is not only synthesizing information inside the rest of the, of the screen, but it's also information that makes sense to be elevated, redesigned just a little bit to be included one step before inside the information architecture. And then, as you dive, you aggregate other elements of the end complexity and build them to aggregate them, aggregate them and to build meaning at a higher level inside the information architecture. And guess what? <laughs> well, writing Time City was something very similar that happened. This document is something that I was working on a few years ago, and just uh, probably 10 or 
two weeks ago I found it. It's called Structure of the Scenes. And there's a nice parallel between structuring the screens and structuring the scenes. Structuring the scenes, this document is kind of empty, besides the end and the beginning, and a few elements in, in the middle. And I remember when I worked on this document, I first worked in the end, the one that I highlighted at the bottom. And what is interesting here is that, well, you have, I worked on the objective of the scene, the last one, I worked on the final situation, what's supposed to happen in the end, and on the initial situation of the scene. This means what's the output, the job to be done, what's the input that enables the job to be done at that stage. And then I worked, and I did the same for the beginning. Because of the nature of Time City, the end, the final situation was the beginning situation, and that's what I was trying to reach. And what happened afterwards? Well, I worked backwards, scene, before scene, before scene, working on the output and the input of each scene, and suing you know, the meaning of each single character, each single story, making sure that from the beginning to the end, or from the end to the beginning, it made sense for each individual uh, persona or character. And then the story was here. That's how it, it emerged. And the parallel is, well, you roll backwards writing, you roll backwards designing the screens. And the message is, when you work on the structure, to ensure coherence and meaning, start with the end of the complexity, and then work backwards to the beginning of the experience. So as a, as a final say, it's work on the archetype, reveal the hidden needs, and then when you work on the complexity, split it, dive into one element of it, nail it, understand it, understand what makes sense, what needs to be aggregated, elevated, assemble these elements to build the, um, the, the step in the journey before, and work backwards. And there is a, um, a, an image, very simple, when you build a house, <laughs> when you enter your, in your house, you enter the door, you know, the entry door, and then you navigate in you know, the corridors, etc. The beginning of the experience is entering in the door. Well, when you build the house, you don't build the door first. There are other elements that you built before. So it's this analogy, if you want. So, both Wellbore and Time City, they helped me understand with clarity this very simple idea. I told you it took me 20 years to make this idea extremely clear in my head and how now I can use that concept to drive and to help to, to, to guide the design of other complex systems. Um, but at the core of it is defining the needs of your archetypes, the job to be done, and then the backward approach towards the beginning of the user's experience. And that's it. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. So, Raphael, you're just in storytelling. What do you think if people want to get into storytelling, what's the first step they should take? Sorry, can you say that? Again? Sorry, yeah. When people are looking to get into storytelling, what's the first step they should take? What, what do you think is the, the initial step to take if you want to start looking at that? If you want to start, tell a story or yeah. write a story? I'll write a story. Let's say we go and write a story. You have to have an idea. Yeah. You have to have an idea on something that you want to write about, something that motivates you. You're okay. That, that, yeah, I mean, all authors, when they write something, it's something about themselves that they, they reveal somehow in, in, the, in, the, in the writing. So, yeah. That would be... Yeah, because I was thinking about, that, like, what's the best piece of advice you'd give to people on how to reflect on their passion and then put that into work? So what's the best th piece of advice to... to give, give someone who would, like, who... Um, how would you say they've ever how to reflect on their passion. So like, if they're really into a particular thing, how would they start that then, into bringing that into their work? <laughs> well, it depends if the passion is their job or not. Yeah, okay. Um, but what the advice I would say is that 
it's probably better not to... F <laughs> well, there are two schools. Some people that will tell you, follow your passion and make your job out of, out of your passion, and some yep. others that will say, keep your passion for another side of your life so that mm -hmm. you can, you know, feed your family and then you can keep, you know, the passion for something that is not paid so you don't get frustrated and you don't ruin your passion uh, okay. over time. So I am more in favor of the, of the second one. <laughs> the second one. Okay. And in this case, what was uh, great is how, uh, you know, the, the two, because it's two passions, the one that I have for design and for writing, mm -hmm. they just came along together in, a, in, that, in that manner. So it's... Uh, and let's say if you are writing and you're, you're, you're putting, against, putting together stories, etc., do you find any particular tools? I'm always interested in what you do as a writing tool. Like, you know, you don't obviously use Grammarly or something. There's no need for that at this point. But do you like, you were talking about your, your colleague and you got together and started putting things together on the whiteboard. Is there a particular methodology that works for you? A methodology to, to write versus design, you mean? Yeah. Um, I used Word a lot. I yep. used paper. Actually, I think I used the same kind of general systems. It was a lot of paper, you know, mm -hmm. drawings, sketching. I mean, I took, I don't know how many notes, you know. I have many uh, 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 notebooks about drawings, about notes, about what's, I mean, uh, throughout all the versions, and it's the same in my job. Okay. How many screens I have designed, you know, architecture. So... Uh, yeah, I would first recommend to, to do that, you know, to put what's in your head in, in paper first. In paper, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, we'll get, take some of the audi our questions from the audience. Um, what did you use to design your fabulous slide deck? There we go, we're into tools again. So guess what? what? <laughs> PowerPoint. It's all made with PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage him. Don't encourage him. I don't know so, how to use Illustrator, but I know how to use PowerPoint. You can do, you know, you can do uh, vectorized images, and you can do uh, well rough things. But I mean, it's it's uh, okay. It's a great this, tool. Is, this is back to those tips again. And how would you inspire stakeholders to work backwards? So that's a well. First, stakeholders don't. Well, what do you mean by stakeholders? You mean decision makers or designers that I work with? Because these are two different people. Decision but makers, go with the decision makers. They don't work backwards. They don't have to because they, okay. uh, they guide, so they will set directions. Yeah. But doing the things is, is more you know, the role of the people that are actually crafting the experience. Okay. Um, and what I do today is, well, I work with the designers, I work with the product owners, and uh, you know, I establish trust with them. And it's... <laughs> The privilege to work with people that are beginning their, experience, their journey in UX is that they, are, they listen. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to convey, uh, you know, uh, advices and to propose or to suggest how to start. Because, you know, when we design complex systems, and I'm thinking of a, a team uh, working on, um, on geothermal, for instance, we have a, a really nice uh, product that is being done by, by uh, the team in Montpellier, where um, we actually, it's another parallel that I didn't put here, but we... The, the way the system, we are designing the system is that we have a scene and, and, and then the, the elements, the physical elements such as panels or navigating in the scene, we, we worked in a, as if it was a physical environment. Okay. Exactly like I designed Time City, where, you know, staging the scenes as if, you know, the camera would be going from one place to another and having a, a physical coherence in things. And working with the designers, we know they have wonderful ideas and then putting all that together, then it helps them, it, it helped me say, well, start with the end. Now you have all the information, you know exactly what to do on that screen, at that stage. And then we can define what is really, info, really meaningful at that stage and we can use that at, and the same information at the, um, at the other stages, at the end of the information architecture, aggregate them, build the dashboard or the intimate dashboard Mm -hmm. and build the experience. And it's the, that confidence uh, that is really useful in the sense that I know that it's fine not to know what's happening at the beginning of the experience. You can dive, forget for a moment mm -hmm. that the experience is not complete, but as you're nailing and understanding what needs to be done, then you grow your confidence at the heart of it, actually. Okay, cool. It's okay. a little bit like a tree. You know, like the way the tree grows is you don't, it doesn't grow from the leaves to, to the roots. Yeah. It starts hidden and then, you know, it, it expands uh, 
little by little. Okay. Um, where can we see Time City? <laughs> well, you can... <laughs> well, it will have to be produced again. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you can have a look at the... Tra there is a trailer on YouTube, if you want. There is a, probably... A, there's not many uh, views, <laughs> just a few uh, hundred of the people who watch the show, probably. But if you type, type C Time City uh, Musical in uh, YouTube, you'll see a two-minute trailer, so you'll have images of what we produce. But, uh, okay, here's a really good one. How do you ensure that your end result isn't a biased result, a version of which you prefer? So, which product are you talking about? The, the tail or the system? You just pick one. Go for it. They're not talking. They're too shy. And what do you mean by biased result? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, what, what, what I would... Who wrote the question? <laughs> oh, you're not going to hear from them. No, it's gone. fine. I just want to understand what you mean by bias question, by bias here, bias result. No, no. We'll move on to the next one. That's good. Okay. <laughs> can you explain how we can pri pri how you prioritize persona needs? Well, when so what, what I've um, learned, I don't know if it's a. a, a, a a complete truth or not, but when we design a system, there's a primary persona. Mm. Sometimes there are others, there are secondary and there are satellite persona, but there is always a primary persona for which, for who you design the system for. And you don't, the way you prioritize the needs is, you know, you do research, you do the interviews, you do a collection of interviews, then you aggregate the results, you identify your insights, and then that's how you prioritize things, and you understand from their job, that there are things that are emerging much more than others. So, for instance, the petrophysicists, what I understood is that they need first to uh, have, you know, their input cleaned, you know, the gamma ray, the resistivity, some basic input, and that they need to generate outputs. Well, this emerged and was clear. I mean, it, it was... The, the other things in their needs were secondary, you know, exporting or collaborating or this kind of thing. It's secondary. It doesn't mean it's not important, but it comes afterwards in the importance of how I can decide what makes sense to build, the, to craft the, 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 the system. System, okay. And that's where I think we're going to have to call it. Uh, we've run out of time. Raphael, really appreciate it. Put your hands together for Raphael. And we'll... Thank you.